It seems like today, everything that we touch has a subscription. From the movies that we watch, the music we listen to, it's unavoidable that we are going to be paying some kind of monthly fee. And the problem is, it's starting to leech off of the internet and into the real world as well. So before the internet was a thing, subscriptions were actually kind of rare, usually associated with some kind of magazine or a specialized membership of some sort. But today, the average US consumer spends $273 a month on subscription services. And that number is only getting bigger. Now, of course, for many of my millennial viewers, you will know that this was not always the case online. You will remember the glory days of Pirate Bay and LimeWire illegally downloading movies and music to our heart's content on our family computers only to lie a couple of days later when it no longer worked because of the 9,000 viruses that were on it. The internet of my youth was a very different place. Everything was free. You could look up anything you wanted. You could watch videos, you could read news, communicate with strangers, make stupid memes, and, and there was very little advertising and basically no price tag attached other than your internet provider's fee. And listen, this was a good time for people, but it wasn't making a lot of money for businesses. And that was a bit of a problem. As more and more people started flocking to platforms like YouTube and Facebook, the advertising dollars came with it. For the first little while, the ads were pretty low key and people just sort of accepted them as the price that you get for free online content. But then, as you probably know, the ads got more frequent and suddenly you were stuck between ads and the illegal download side of things, which we all knew at that point, was very, very bad. So in some ways, subscriptions were actually a solution to the Wild West internet of the time. A lot of people my age were actually kind of tired of replacing their computers all the time. So when Spotify promised us the entire world of music for $10.99 or whatever, it seemed like a no brainer. Today though, subscriptions essentially control how we interact with the internet and the kinds of content that we see. And that has some very big implications. A recent Forbes article said that the subscription economy is estimated to reach $1.5 trillion next year. It seems like every single day there's a new product or a service that requires a monthly fee and it's changing the way that we interact with the internet and the world around us. But first, one thing that I think we need to understand is that subscriptions are really good at tricking us into thinking they're a good idea. Most people underestimate monthly subscription costs by at least $100, and up to 70% of consumers forget about or rarely use the subscription services that they are subscribed to. The subscription economy sort of works on the assumption that you're going to forget that you're subscribed to something. And they also use things called dark patterns, like making cancellations incredibly complex so that you give up out of frustration. Of course, you've probably been there before clicking through all these different web pages to figure out how to unsubscribe to something. Well, that's done on purpose. On average, it takes 6.7 clicks to get from on home page to cancellation, which is just six more clicks than it takes for you to hit that like button. Oh, did you do it? Did you do it yet? And see that guilt tactic I did there at the end? That's also a part of their business model. Because when you try to unsubscribe from a business, it's like trying to get out of a toxic relationship with a friend. For example, they'll offer discounts right up to the cancellation moment, encourage you to pause your subscription rather than cancel it, or try to guilt you or make you feel like you're gonna miss out if you do. They hit you with the classics, are you sure? You know, some version of, oh my God, we're so sorry to see you go. Subscriptions also tap into this growing loneliness epidemic by offering us something that feels and looks a little bit like community. They want to make us feel like we have some kind of insider privilege or that we're connected to something bigger than just ourselves sitting alone at our computer. Even the language that they use around these subscriptions is geared to hook us. Phrases like loyalty programs, prime memberships, VIP packages that make us feel special. Now, ironically, of course, the creator of the World Wide Web thought that the internet 
should be, quote, an open platform that would allow everyone everywhere to share information, access opportunities, and collaborate across boundaries. And in many ways, it is exactly that, but subscriptions are threatening to change that. Today, almost every interaction that you have online is monetized with either ads or subscriptions or both. Of course, it was only a matter of time before social media started turning towards subscription plans too. We have Meta Verified, which is for Instagram and Facebook. We have X or whatever and Snapchat Plus. In the US, more households have an Amazon Prime membership than those who decorate a Christmas tree or have pets. And you can literally see this in how the internet is used. Streaming services especially dominate global internet traffic with Netflix alone hogging 15%. But don't worry, YouTube is right behind them. And probably one of the most maddening things that has happened in the last little while is we've started bundling these subscription streaming services together, basically reinventing cable all over again. What was once a free and creative space has become divided into hierarchies of access controlled by a handful of large corporations who monopolize power instead of allowing it to be a public and universal good. Every road that you turn down nowadays online seems to lead to a paywall. And as the author Ben Tarnaff says, the internet was built with public money, but it's controlled by private corporations. Maybe, like he says, the internet is broken because it is a business. So how terrifying is it that that business model is now leeching out of our digital worlds and infiltrating our physical spaces too. Yes, that's right. Our physical world is getting more subscriptions now than we ever have before. Your weekly meals, the furniture in your house, the razors that you shave your face with, and the heated seats in your car can be delivered to you via subscription. That's right, BMW recently turned heated seats into a software subscription in their cars, charging $18 a month for the option just to turn them on, even though they were physically installed in the car already when you bought it. Now, of course, as many of you may know, they did discontinue this plan after consumers logically hated it, but other subscriptions are still being offered and the precedent is now set. The craziest part about this is that these functions are installed into the cars when you buy them. They're just literally withholding things by a digital barrier that you then have to pay to have access to. And this is only going to become more and more common with vehicles going into the future. Tesla has been shipping cars with battery packs that had their range limited by software. So owners could then pay to unlock their full capacity. This is a huge trend and you're gonna see it a lot, although right now it seems to be affecting mostly luxury cars, but analysts are saying that subscriptions are coming to mass market vehicles in the future. American automobile manufacturing companies are saying that revenue from in-car subscriptions will grow to $25 billion by the end of the decade, and that puts them right alongside Netflix and Spotify. These are crazy numbers. I mean, what's next? A car with a subscription that requires you to watch ads before you get out of your driveway in the morning? I'm looking, I'm looking at you every streaming service ever nowadays, particularly Netflix. Please increase greater well-being. Guess Stand pump commercials drive you crazy. Here's, Here's a quick fix. Hit this button. And look, listen, I hate to say it, but the subscription business model works so well. It really does. That's why you see creators asking you to contribute to the Patreon page or to become a member on their YouTube channel. Because our Patreon is the closest thing that we have to stable income, right? In this way, the creator or business itself gets a predictable revenue, which is very rare in this new online advertising dominated industry. And obviously, listen, uh, we're a little biased here because we're a YouTube channel with a Patreon page uh, that you can subscribe to, to help us pay our bills. But we are a perfect example of why this is happening all over the place and why it is such a common thing to see online. This channel relies almost completely on AdSense revenue from Google, which is just the ads that you see in this video while you're trying to watch it. And that income can be very volatile. The other way of making money is also advertising through brand deals, but that doesn't work super well for a company like us that 
has certain moral and ethical standards with the kinds of brands that we work with. To give you a very specific example, if you've followed this channel's journey over the years, you might know that we tried to launch another channel called Future Proof Health. And it failed for a few reasons, but one big one was our inability to predict the income that we got from YouTube. If we had a more consistent and predictable source of income, who knows what might have happened with that channel. If you want to hear the full gruesome story of what happened to that channel. We released an exclusive podcast over on our Patreon page, of course. On that page, we give you exclusive content that doesn't make it here on YouTube, and you get early access to all of our videos. I know I'm ironically making a pitch for our subscription in a video tackling subscriptions, but it is genuinely a thing that many channels need to do. It's a great way to support what we do, but it doesn't stop them from being deeply problematic and very annoying. When so much of the internet and our lives is consumed by subscription, we are psychologically affected by what researchers call subscription overload. We are so inundated in these kinds of services that our perspective on them is kind of warped. I personally think that a lot of this willingness to buy into all these subscriptions is a learned behavior. A lot of millennials and younger generations have just kind of come to think that this is normal. If you talk to boomers or other older generations, the options were a lot more cut and dry. You couldn't afford a car, you just walked. You forgot to buy groceries for dinner, you ate beans out of a can. There is a definite psychological aspect to this because I will say that my parents are much more hesitant to sign up for any kind of monthly costs. They don't have Netflix or anything. But today we live in a world where convenience is prioritized above all else. Rather than buying CDs and having them stacked up in the corner of your living room, we have Spotify to give us access to every song that has ever been written by any human being or AI ever. And this sounds pretty great, right? I mean, you could never own or afford to own all of that music yourself. But the interesting side effect of this is that we now no longer own anything. Now bear with me here because this is a whole other layer that I want you to try and contemplate for a second. If we don't own anything, what does that mean for us moving into the future? I know personally that I could list the names of every artist that I loved growing up and I had all their CDs. And today, I barely know any of the artists that are on my Spotify wrapped. Music means less when you're just clicking on playlists based on mood or what the algorithm has served to you based on the other recommendations of other things that you've clicked on in the past. Do you care as much about your rented apartment as you would about one that you own? Statistically, no. Do we enjoy food as much if it's delivered to our door as when we cook it ourselves? Also no. My skepticism here is that we have never lived in a time where we've had so much, but owned so little. And this disassociation from our physical and digital worlds just makes it less likely to feel a personal responsibility for how we use it or how we interact with it. And the lack of personal connection to the clothes that we wear or the software that we use or the movies that we watch or the apps that we rely on just makes us apathetic to their existence as long as they do what we want them to do. But in the writing of the script, our Gen Z writer had a less pessimistic perspective than I do. Classic youth, am I right? So let's hear her out. If the whole concept of subscription services is built on the idea of making us believe that we own something when we don't, maybe that just means someone else will take responsibility for it. Let's take fashion subscriptions for an example. With some of these services, you can rent an article of clothing that you'd ordinarily only wear like once say a wedding dress or a very specific themed birthday party, for example. And later you can return it to get something else. These and other clothing services give the consumer the freedom to return clothes that they no longer need without it piling up in their closet and then eventually in the landfill. The optimist in me would say that this is actually a great opportunity for companies to build something truly durable and long lasting because their businesses are no longer just creating clothing to be sold once, but to be used and shared for years to come. Furniture subscription companies operate in a similar way. If services like these can pivot consumerist industries towards the subscription model of use rather than ownership, 
there is the potential to reduce environmental impact, extend the lifespan of our items, and overall lower the amount of waste that our generates. All because we get our psychological fix of ownership without actually owning a material product, thanks to the subscription model. Okay, now, I don't know, that, that sounds pretty good when I say it out loud, but I want to know what you think are subscriptions going to make the world better in the future? Is there a possibility of that? We love to hear your feedback here in the comments or on our subreddit page or on our Patreon. Uh, uh, uh. If you do like what we make, you wanna see more of it, subscribe. Damn it, did it again. That was two calls to subscribe to. Anyway, I don't know how to sign off other than that because I'm a YouTuber on the internet that you're watching. Bye. <laughs>